Hi, good morning and welcome to Glucose Product Theater Session, Redesigning the Future of Diabetes Care with Telehealth. We're pleased to have you join us today for the ADA Product Theater Session. My name is Ryan Kirkos, a Senior Marketing Manager here at Gluco. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Mark Clements and Jeff Chang. Dr. Clemens is a leading endocrinologist in the US. He's an expert in da diabetes data and analytics who has a broad experience in patient care and clinical research. He's a practicing physician at Children's Mercy in Kansas City and also serves as the chief medical officer here at Gluco. Jeff Chang is our director of product management at Gluco and leads the product development for our clinician and patient experience. Jeff lives with type one diabetes and is passionate about leveraging technology to improve the lives of people in this community. We're excited to have you all join us today to discuss this important topic during these historic and unprecedented times. Before we begin, I wanna let you know that a copy of the handouts can be downloaded at any time during the live session. The session is being recorded and will be made available. Finally, we'd love to hear from you, our audience. So please feel free to provide your questions or comments at any time through the message box on your screen highlighted below. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it to Dr. Mark Clements to kick off the presentation. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to be able to share with you uh, our vision for the future of remote care and remote patient monitoring and diabetes. So I have several objectives before I hand it off to my colleague, uh, Jeff Chang. My objectives are to address issues relevant to both type one and type two diabetes and that impact both children and adults with diabetes. Specifically, I plan to answer the following questions. Uh, number one, what is the immediate impact of COVID-19 on diabetes care in diabetes clinics worldwide? Number two, uh, how does one make the transition from in-person care to virtual diabetes care uh, by incorporating all of the elements needed uh, for successful uh, telehealth and remote care? And finally, how do we imagine a future state driven by the demand by persons with diabetes for virtual diabetes care in the future? So first, let's discuss the immediate impact of COVID-19 on diabetes care. I'm gonna share with you 10 things I hate about COVID in response to my experience delivering clinical care uh, in the past 10 to 12 weeks. The first is that clinic volumes are down for myself and for all of my colleagues. And this decrease in volume is reducing access and delaying care. The second is that patient reported outcomes are missing. Many of us use intake forms or patient health assessments at the beginning of our visits in order to understand what the needs of the individual are. And these have been uh, decreased in volume or missing entirely in visits. The third is that device uploads are hard. And fourth is that device uploads into multiple platforms are harder, especially when conducted from the patient home. Next, for many diabetes centers, A1C values are plain and simply missing. Distractions during visits are a problem. We can often see siblings uh, distracting the parents uh, during my pediatric visits. And uh, I think that uh, life is happening in the background during telehealth visits. Internet bandwidth is sometimes a limiting factor. And quite often technology can be the elephant in the room. Essential data can be absent from our assessments. For instance, the uh, absence of device data and goal setting can be more challenging, particularly because people are experiencing limitations on their diet during the pandemic, limitations on their physical activity, and sometimes limitations on access to therapies. So what have we learned in uh, response to COVID-19? First, COVID-19 caused an immediate decline in diabetes clinic volumes across the US and I'm sure in other countries as well. Many clinics have reported volumes down 50 or more percent. What I'm showing you here in this graphic is a single site in the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange Quality Improvement Collaborative that uh, indicates that when shelter in place and social distancing orders went into effect, there was a drop to almost zero clinic volume for several weeks, followed by a slow rise to partial clinic volumes at about 20 to 40 percent. 
COVID-19 has also caused essential data to be absent from visits. Many clinics have reported difficulty distributing visit intake forms and mental health screening tools. And next, COVID-19 has caused essential data needed for clinical decision-making to be absent from visits. So uh, you can see here that uh, the intake forms that I mentioned earlier, uh, if they're delivered via a, uh, an electronic tracking form, uh, can be tracked. And while typically during an in-person patient visit, we get these completed 100% of the time at all of our diabetes clinic visits, uh, it can be difficult to get 100% of the data returned when you're trying to do this virtually. And I've heard from colleagues across uh, the US that they've had similar issues. Next, COVID-19 has made it more challenging for us to review device data in preparation for or during clinic visits. So again, these are data from a site in the Type 1 Diabetes Exchange QI Collaborative that indicate that, again, while during a typical in-person visit, we would achieve 100% of devices downloaded, during telehealth visits, we're at best achieving about 60% of devices downloaded. And this just speaks to the difficulty of teaching individuals and families to upload device data from home. We also know that the ecosystem for sharing diabetes device data has been fragmented and confusing for years. I want to remind you that five years ago, uploads in diabetes clinic looked something like the picture to the left. And the software clinics have to manage today is just as confusing. Imagine what the experience of persons with diabetes is, they're having a difficult time mastering the upload process at home. And in my experience are requiring sometimes 40 or more minutes of assistance just to get that first upload experience to be successful from home. So how do we take what we've learned and what our experiences have been during social distancing and shelter in place during the pandemic and make the transition to successfully incorporate virtual diabetes care into practice? Well, I think there are a number of essential ingredients. So first, we must figure out the essential ingredients uh, for successful telehealth visits and potentially for successful remote patient monitoring. Second, we have to define SMART goals and key drivers. Thirdly, we have to apply design thinking and process maps to innovatively develop interventions that can improve our processes for virtual care. And finally, we should implement the model for improvement so that we can measure, track, and understand when a change in our processes yields an improvement. So I like this article uh, by Cross and Raymond and Neinstein that came out recently in Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics because it essentially outlines the essential ingredients for a successful diabetes telehealth program. They provide the top 10 tips from their perspective. I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see them listed here. And I'm going to highlight the ones in red, namely hardware, diabetes software, and electronic health record integration of data. So first, the authors comment that use of a single common sized monitor, such as a 24 inch monitor, leaves insufficient room on screen to view the person with diabetes or the family members, his or her shared diabetes data and the electronic health record simultaneously. So I have colleagues in the field who are using two laptops and a tablet computer, for instance, to accomplish this. So we really have to think about the design of our office spaces at home and at the office in order to support all the needs of a successful diabetes telehealth visit. Second, the authors contend that diabetes software should have certain components available. First is compatibility with the broadest array of devices. The second is that the data should be easy to upload from home. There should be seamless and flexible account administration. Data visualizations should be top-notch. The vendors should offer technical support for the product. There should be the capacity to capture other health-related data, such as diet data and activity data. 
healthcare providers should be able to view a panel of their clinic's own patients. And there should be tools to help support clinical documentation, which we know is a burden for healthcare providers. It's also necessary to think about how one standardizes telehealth visit process. So the authors contend that persons with diabetes will need to upload and share data from their home devices prior to each video visit. And one should be very thoughtful about the timing with which they should do so. This timing should be communicated to the patient and the family, and each diabetes practice should consider how to train and support persons with diabetes who are not familiar with the process. So we must answer the question, where on the patient journey should device data sharing occur? Next, the authors contend that electronic health record integration is of paramount importance. Certain diabetes software platforms are now helping with this process by automating the output of summary glucose statistics and summary insulin statistics so that clinicians can avoid the time-consuming and mistake-prone process of transcribing numbers into the electronic health record. So now that we've listed the top 10 ingredients for successful telehealth and remote care, I'm going to go on to help define what I think the processes are uh, that are necessary for implementing a successful program. The first is to define SMART goals for your clinic. This just makes business sense. One should have a goal that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. Once you have a SMART goal or a SMART aim, a clinic really benefits from creating a key driver diagram. So a key driver diagram usually lists those factors or elements that are primary drivers for achieving the goal. In addition, uh, one can often identify secondary drivers that can help achieve the goal. A perfect example at a patient level for primary and secondary drivers is that if one wants to achieve optimal glycemic control, a primary driver for that might be that uh, one should dose insulin prior to every meal. If, however, one is a teenager with diabetes, it might be difficult to remember. So a secondary driver that helps to drive mealtime insulin bolus behavior would be setting reminders on one's phone, for instance. And so we want to do this at a population level and at a process level in clinics. Uh, the third component or fourth component, I guess, to uh, a key driver diagram is one then needs to develop a collection of change ideas. These are the interventions that you think might move the needle on the secondary and primary drivers and help you to achieve your SMART goal. One should apply design thinking to the change ideas. So first, one should empathize and develop a deep understanding of the challenge. That will allow you to define the problem and clearly articulate the problem you want to solve. Then it's necessary to get a group of experts, uh, colleagues perhaps in your own clinic together to ideate and brainstorm potential solutions. Finally, prototyping or developing a series of prototypes to test all or part of your solution uh, can help you to achieve your objective. And then one should test by engaging in iterative development and design, uh, continuous short cycles of innovation. I find that creating a process map really helps with this process. So you can't really define the problem that you're experiencing with a transition to virtual care if you haven't mapped out what it looks like from beginning to end. What I'm showing here is a prototypical process map for an in-person clinic appointment. But one could develop a similar kind of process map for a virtual care visit. And then finally, there are lots of tools in the field to guide us. So I really like the model for improvement, which asks three fundamental questions. What are we trying to accomplish? How will we know that a change is an improvement? And what change can we make that will result in improvement? And then one uses the Deming wheel or plan, do, study, act cycles to iteratively test interventions and to iteratively improve until you achieve the SMART aim. 
And one last note about all of this is that managing our diabetes clinic's fiscal health must be a goal because access and quality care depend on the physical health of diabetes centers. So I highly recommend that clinicians understand your payer landscape uh, at a clinic level. Understand which codes they're providing payment for. Use the new remote patient monitoring codes if at all possible. Understand what they are. Use continuous glucose monitoring interpretation codes. Use mental health screening codes and use diabetes education codes to your full advantage. Finally, it's important to remove friction in your process map to manage volume, which will help with the fiscal health of the diabetes center by optimizing RVUs. And if necessary, one can conduct time studies. So next I'd like to transition to imagining what a future state driven by continued demand for virtual care might look like. The first thing we need to support virtual care, which I believe will be an essential ingredient in future diabetes care, is continuously and passively connected devices. Passive data sharing with the healthcare team is a necessity. Data sharing should require no button presses and no active sync. This is the state that we need to achieve. Next, there should be ubiquitous EMR integration of self-management device data. These data uh, can be summarized for documentation, and once they're in the electronic health record, they can be integrated with other health data. We're seeing a number of examples of such devices in the ecosystem for diabetes care already. There are a growing number of glucometers that are Bluetooth enabled. There are now smart Bluetooth enabled insulin pens. Uh, soon we're going to see the first insulin pump that can uh, seamlessly and passively share data uh, uh, with healthcare providers, which I think is a remarkable development. And of course, we all know the story of continuous glucose monitoring and the success stories there with sharing data with loved ones and healthcare providers. So in order to explain uh, what these connected devices are going to do to uh, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, it's first important to understand what the original hierarchy of human needs looked like. Remember that Maslow's hierarchy included things like love and belonging and safety and security. And I say this a little tongue in cheek, but in the modern era, Maslow's hierarchy of human needs needs to be updated uh, to incorporate things like a strong, robust Wi-Fi signal and strong 5G data connectedness. So what happens if we have all of these essential ingredients? Well, we now have an ecosystem where we can create what one might call a virtuous cycle, where the person with diabetes is sharing data seamlessly from their self-management devices. It's going to the cloud. There, a data listening engine or engines uh, can uh, create insights from the data. Those insights can create alerts for the diabetes care team and the diabetes care team can intervene. And some of the innovative approaches to intervention may include text message interventions or virtual micro visits. So all of these together fall into the category of just-in-time adaptive interventions. And I think this is going to be the mainstay of therapy in the future. Technology supported just-in-time adaptive interventions. The goal of course, since individuals with diabetes spend greater than 99.9% .9 of their time away from the diabetes care team living with diabetes is to have smart systems that can nudge behavior as evidenced in this book called Nudge about improving decisions related to health and happiness. Another thing becomes possible at a population level once we achieve this state, and that is advanced predictive analytics driving precision care. So imagine a state where future hemoglobin A1C levels, for instance, could be predicted so that we can deliver not just one size fits all care in the diabetes clinic, but we could actually tailor care to the individual based on individual risks and individual needs. A similar example is that it is now possible to predict hospital admissions for diabetic ketoacidosis. What if we could identify who those individuals are 
And if we could offer more intensive monitoring or more frequent touch points of care, where we have population monitoring that helps us to identify individuals, uh, 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 mHealth data, and use those data to create near real-time risk stratification and potentially even actionable alerts so that we can then use all the tools in our toolbox, not just new devices and drugs, technologies, but also things like mentoring programs and community support, and health coaches, in order to provide the uniquely tailored care that individuals with diabetes deserve. Ultimately, I think what we will achieve in the future is what I call the long tail model of precision medicine. So I shamelessly stole this from the business world uh, where um, business uh, uh, minds talk about the long tail of the marketplace. There are some products that are very popular that 80% of the population will want to buy, but there are also individuals who have real neat niche tastes and would like to buy a product that there's only a small market for. Well, we can adapt the long tail model from business to uh, medicine and create the long tail model of precision medicine. So I'd next like to hand the presentation off to my colleague, uh, Jeff Chang, who's gonna talk about how Gluco is innovating uh, new tools uh, to help support the future of diabetes virtual care and remote patient monitoring. Thanks, Dr. Clements, appreciate it. Let me just get my screen set up here. Great. So I love hearing and talking to Dr. Clements because I think the way he thinks about the future of this problem shapes the way we at Gluco think about building product. Um, we think really about our product as serving this virtuous cycle between the patient and the care team. And so starting on the right here with the patient, you have the patient that uses digital tools at home. Um, it, it can be done through a service like Gluco. Uh, they have access to a mobile app and other tools to upload their data. And ultimately they're sharing that data with the care team in order to collaborate on health. The care team or, or the clinician has a way to manage all the patients that are connected to, uh, to, the, to their care team. And they're also able to triage the patients. So Dr. Clements was talking about being able to predict which of your patients are highest at risk and being able to assign specific interventions. And so after you triage these patients, you're able to identify the target patient group and then deliver those just-in-time interventions. And I'll walk, through, walk you through a little bit about how Gluco thinks about that today. So Gluco has a connected diabetes ecosystem that really starts with the telehealth and RPM bubble that you see here on the right. I'll get into each, each bubble in a little more detail, but at a high level, the telehealth and RPM features today consist of a Gluco population tracker with case management. It also has a transmitter that lets you download devices in the clinic and an uploader that allows a patient to upload devices from home. The patient has a mobile app that they can use at home and that's a primary interface for the patient and their data. The patient can also use that to share data with the clinician. And lastly, Gluco is compatible with over 190 plus diabetes and health devices. So any sort of context you wanna to add to your diabetes data or your diabetes data itself can easily be synced into the Gluco platform. Getting into the mobile app a little bit, the mobile app is for your patients with diabetes. And the mobile app allows a patient to review their diabetes data, allows you to sync your diabetes data as well, and ultimately visualize the, the correlations between your activity, your medication, and your carbs, uh, and how those things influence your glucose levels. As a patient, you can set reminders for clear care plan adherence. Uh, you can get started on a digital intervention that I'll talk about shortly, um, and your, your clinician can ultimately set reminders for you as well. And as a patient, you can share a PDF or you can connect your account to your clinician's account in order to enable that remote patient monitoring setup. As a clinician, you have access to what we call our population tracker. And this is really the meat of the system. It allows you to see flags and alerts in real time for patients meeting your desired criteria. So for instance, you could say, show me all my patients that have had, that have had a BG less than 70 in the past week and those patients would rise to the top of the list. You can also use case management features so you can coordinate care across the different constituents in your care team uh, and leave notes such as I called Jeff on uh, October 20th. 
Lastly, you have access to very relevant at a glance statistics. So just scanning down the list, you can see exactly who has synced recently, what their average BG or CGM are, and whether or not they meet certain criteria to throw you a, a, an alert or a flag. The population tracker also has very clinically relevant, easy to use charts and graphs. So as you see on the left here, we have the AGP and we use the beyond, met, beyond A1C metrics in our uh, visualizations and statistics. And then you also have access to a really robust way to visualize day over day data and get all the aggregate stats or contextual information that you're looking for as a clinician. The second part of our ecosystem is what, we, what we're calling our advanced insights uh, platform. And so the, the, the Gluco platform allows you to look at uh, different at-risk groups of patients. You can also view how your interventions are doing. And so looking at pre and post outcomes, uh, but also provides you business intelligence analytics for your health system. So if you want, if you're running a quality improvement initiative, you can see exactly how that in initiative is doing for your health system. Covering that in a little bit more detail, um, we're hoping that the Advanced Insights platform will allow you to triage at-risk patients. So for instance, you can use beyond A1C metrics to cohort groups, groups of patients uh, and, and assign those patients to digital therapeutic uh, or just-in-time intervention as Dr. Clements was talking about. You can also use this platform to track population outcomes at scale. So for instance, if you wanna look at all your patients that have ever been put on a CGM or all your patients that have ever been put on, a, on an insulin pump or closed loop system, you can do that analysis right here in the platform to know how well your money is being spent. Lastly, we're working on a set of predictive analytics that are machine learning based so that we can get to that, that spot where we can tell you exactly which of your patients may be at risk for future hospitalization or which, which of your patients uh, may be at risk for DKA. Um, also down the line, we'd love to be able to predict A1C uh, for your patients as well. The third portion of our connected ecosystem is a digital therapeutics arm. And this is the arm that can help deliver those just-in-time interventions um, and, and, our, and live on the Gluco platform. And so today we have a few digital therapeutics today. On the left here is our mobile insulin dosing system called MIDS. Uh, this helps people with type two diabetes simplify long-acting titration in between visits. It's a program that you initiate and prescribe to your patient and the patient interacts with it on their Gluco phone. And so because they have the app at home, they're able to get reminders to check their blood glucose, get reminders to take their insulin. And you as a clinician are able to see in real time everything that the patient is doing with the MIDS application. In the middle and on the right represents partnerships that we have with thought leaders in the diabetes algorithm space. We're always looking to partner with more partners, but today we are integrated with DreamEd, which is a company that helps um, algorith algorithmically um, prescribe optimized pump settings to patients, uh, typically type one patients, uh, in order to optimize their insulin dosing. And Melitus Health on the right is for type two diabetes and helps to optimize new or existing insulin regimens. So as a clinician, you're able to prescribe any one of these uh, modules or digital therapeutics to your patient so that they can better have control at home and helps you scale your remote monitoring programs. On the bottom right, we have EHR integrations. Uh, we have a robust set of EHR integrations with the leading uh, EHR providers like Allscripts, Cerner, Epic, um, a couple different types of integrations. Uh, we have an API-based integration. Um, we make available Gluco uh, report summaries available via the uh, integrations, so you can actually get a PDF delivered directly to your EHR. We also provide uh, flow sheet statistics through our API integrations as well. So with that, we are able to better mobilize this patient healthcare professional connection through the different modules and features that we have within Gluco. So again, filling this circle out with Gluco features, the patient uses a Gluco app at home and they're being prescribed digital therapeutics by the clinician. The patient is sharing data with the healthcare professional and the, the HCP is using population tracker. They're also using those advanced insights to know who exactly to target, who to be placing on remote patient monitoring. And once they identify those patient groups, they're able to better deliver those just-in-time interventions to those patients. So with that, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Ryan. Thanks, Jeff. It's uh, <clears throat> very clear that there's a new future shaping itself and that every one of us will be making an impact to help define what this new future looks like. 
one of the points which Jeff and Dr. Clemens mentioned was the value of remote patient monitoring. Remote patient monitoring has seen a rapid growth in the last few months with COVID-19 public health emergency. Interestingly, Gluco has had remote monitoring capabilities from very early on. We're fortunate enough to be in a unique position to offer the widest range of integrations across 200 plus devices in the market, including blood glucose meters, CGMs, insulin pumps, and connected insulin pens. I wanted to cover some of the opportunities with remote patient monitoring that are enabled by Gluco Enterprise for the wide range of patients you may have across your systems. So to go back, <clears throat> Medicare launched RPM reimbursement with the 99091 code in January of 2018. This allowed for the remote management of patients with 30 minutes of remote monitoring and interpretation done by eligible clinicians. <clears throat> While this was a great step from CMS to shift to new models of care, there were some recognized opportunities which CMS quickly put into effect the following year. What they did is unbundle the 99091 into three different codes, which were for patient setup, remote transmission of data, and time spent interacting with the patient. This also allowed for clinical staff supervised, supervised by physicians to spend time with their patient and interaction, patient interaction. This was a big opportunity since it allowed for the offices to leverage various individuals in the staff and not just the providers. Earlier this year, CMS also introduced 99458, which allows for an additional 20 minutes of interactive communication with the patient. Now, this is where we left off in January 2020 and where we thought RPM would have been for the rest of the year. But of course, with the COVID-19 pandemic, CMS has released over 80 different codes to accommodate various needs and reimbursement requirements, which help us all to shift to a virtual care model. A few of the important ones to note are listed here. So one, there, was a co there is a co-insurance required for patients with remote patient monitoring, which CMS has now waived the requirement for. So you can actually have a reduced co-insurance or, or no co-insurance at all. The requirement for a supervision with clinical staff, that's, that can now be changed to be outsourced uh, with general supervision versus direct supervision. And finally, the opportunity for virtual check-ins and e-visits, which are uh, patient-initiated at various rates, as well as for remote evaluation of video and photos sent to the provider for evaluation. So similar to what Dr. Clement said before, some of these micro visits. I wanted to get into RPM, remote patient monitor codes, at and what it takes to have a successful program. So at a foundational level, the few points to note are First, you need to have patient consent before they enroll into a program, which is documented into the EHR. The RPM program must be ordered by a physician or a qualified healthcare professional, such as an advanced practice provider, an NP, a PA, or a CNS. And data must be provided by devices which are defined by the FDA as a medical device. And this is transmitted and monitored by these providers. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this can be done by clinical staff with these new four new codes, uh, which is different than the 99091 introduced a few years back. And finally, the billing frequency. These can be billed either once, depending on the type of um, code it is, or every 30 days. <clears throat> the reimbursement rates do differ, but generally there is around $156 per patient per month that is reimbursable plus one-time setup and education codes, uh, which will help you from a patient setup and education uh, for remote patient monitoring. These are, everything listed here is just the average national rate, which are geographically unadjusted. 99453 is for patient education setup, and that reimburses about $19 one time. 99454 is for the transmission of this data for a minimum of 16 days in a month, which is about $62 per month. With the Gluco Enterprise system, you can easily track these data points and gain insights on each one of your patients. Then comes 99457 and 99458. 99457 is for the initial 
or first 20 minutes of interactive communication with the provider or clinical staff member, reimbursed at $52 per patient per month. With the Gluco Enterprise platform, you can actually track when you, did, when you have communicated with patients and when a follow-up needs to occur. And 99458, which is the newly introduced code as of earlier this year, which allows for an additional 20 minutes or more of patient interaction by the provider or a clinical staff member, reimbursing at around $42 per patient per month. Now, it is important to note, besides RPM, there are a few other CPT codes that you may be interested in. So I had mentioned some of the ones that CMS has introduced for uh, during this uh, public health emergency, but there are uh, long-standing ones such as the CGM monitoring codes. These are the 95250 and 95251 for CGM placement and monitoring. 95250 is for a minimum of three days of CGM monitoring. It includes sensor placement, the removal and download of data, and that is reimbursed about $153 per month. And while this is not strictly remote, the, complement, the complementary CPT code 95251 is. So that one is, a, is for remote CGM monitoring. It does not explicitly require professional CGM to be placed. So a personal one would be sufficient. It's important to keep in mind that this would be in addition to RPM services if it's clinically and if it's clinically needed and appropriate. So this is an additional $36 per patient per month. And providers will be able to monitor all their CGM data directly from the Gluco population tracker. While this is just an overview, Gluco hosted a few webinars recently going deeper into the foundational reimbursement topics and specifically RPM billing. We have made the tools and resources created by leading experts in the field available to the general public. And you can find this as well as other tools to help your practice shift to these new models of care through gluco.com slash webinars. With that said, I wanna thank you all for your time today. We will kick off the Q&A now uh, for the rest of the session. Joined by my co colleagues, Dr. Clemens, as well as uh, Jeff Chang. Thanks, Ryan. So the first question that we received is, what kind of data can be shared to the EHR and what are those methods? I can take that one. Um, today, we're writing a few different things to EHR. We have uh, what we call flow sheet statistics. So those are uh, discrete data points, such as your BG, your CGM, or activity, or medication. We can write those directly into the HR. Um, we also have the ability to generate a PDF. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me, Gluco has a, a PDF report that can be exported into the, into the EHR. And also uh, patient summary statistics can also be exported in the EHR. So if you wanna know, for instance, average glucose for two weeks, we can write that data directly into the EHR. And so that's available through a couple of different ways. Um, one is a direct API integration. Um, so obviously we write, we can write data directly via API into your EHR system. A second way is, and a feature that we most recently launched is actually a copy and paste function. So you have the ability to copy and paste specific functions out of Glu or specific data sets or data points out of Gluco and paste that directly into your EHR. Thanks Jeff. This one is for um, Jeff again. What kind of uh, insights or what kind of data analytics is possible on um, the Gluco Enterprise Platform? Yeah, the Gluco Enterprise Platform, uh, I think you might be asking about the, the, uh, the analytics platform. So the, a bunch of different types of um, glucose uh, and insulin and activity related data. Um, so for instance, you can get a, average BG, you can get your beyond A1C metrics writing Gluco. Um, but then you can also, if you're, let's say you're running a, a filter on a cohort of patients, you can filter on anything from uh, patient demographics, such as, uh, you know, type of diabetes for the patients, uh, ages, um, you can filter on beyond, beyond A1C metrics, like your check rate, your CGM active time, your average glucose, or your percentage of readings above or below a certain metric uh, or a certain value. Um, you can filter on devices. So for instance, uh, you can see which ones of your patients are using an insulin pump, which are using CGM or a pen, um, or also the last clinic visit date. 
And so all these things together can help you identify which of your patients are really gonna be uh, highest risk and which ones you should prescribe these digital interventions to. Thanks. And this one is for um, Dr. Clemens. How do I get buy-in from my team on implementing a remote patient monitoring program? Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So there are several levels at which one could consider this question. So one is how do I get buy-in from my leadership team? Uh, and the second is how do I get buy-in from my clinical colleagues in the diabetes center? Uh, so let me take them one at a time. So, uh, you know, getting buy-in from a leadership level, uh, you know, usually requires that you're putting together some kind of a business plan uh, for conversion. Now, of course, during the pandemic, uh, lots of institutions had to make rapid change, and a lot of the normal processes for decision making uh, were set aside um, uh, just for speed. But I would highly recommend that one take the information that you shared, Ryan, on the uh, cost benefits um, and, and the you know business case uh, for remote patient monitoring. Uh, as well as uh, information on uh, telehealth and the reimbursement available for telehealth and present that in a formal business plan to the leadership team. I would also recommend that um, individuals check out the AHRQ website, which has some information on how to get buy-in from leadership at your organization uh, for organizational change. Uh, and from the, the uh, Intermountain Health Institute, the IHI, uh, which just has a, a great resource toolkit uh, for individuals conducting quality improvement work. Uh, getting leadership buy-in for change is um, needing a change in culture if an institution is not already actively pursuing quality improvement. So you have to uh, start small and then grow it. Uh, the second level of buy-in that you need to get is in your own diabetes center. So it's actually your colleagues who are clinicians and diabetes educators and nurses and other staff in the diabetes center who are going to be most impacted by change. So uh, there are, again, a number of guides out there uh, through IHI. Uh, you could probably just Google, you know, how do I uh, get buy-in from my team for quality improvement work? And you'll find a whole host of uh, video lectures out there on the best practices for uh, getting buy-in from team members. One thing is for sure, it's very difficult to implement change if you're trying to implement change um, against a current of resistance. And so, um, you know, one book uh, uh, that I have found uh, really helpful during my career was a a uh, book by Malcolm Gladwell that just talks about how ideas um, take off and become uh, uh, sort of epidemic ideas. Um, uh, a perfect example that Gladwell uh, provides is, uh, you know, we all know about the midnight ride of Paul Revere um, and how uh, individuals responded. But a lot of people don't know that there were actually several writers who went out in the middle of the night and we didn't hear about the other writers. We heard about Paul Revere because he knew how to make ideas epidemic. So uh, learn how to make ideas epidemic in your own clinic, and uh, you'll, you'll start a small revolution, I think, of change. Awesome. So a question came in regarding the CPT codes, um, and if you can build 99091 along with the other four codes. Um, so you cannot build those simultaneously, you would actually, you would have to choose the one you would be billing for that month. So it's either 99091, which we mentioned earlier, or the additional four CPT codes. Um, just keep in mind that the, with the 99091 code, uh, that is for 30 minutes of uh, physician time. So in many practices where they might not have that time, um, the other four codes could be, are unbundled. They are paid at, a, at various rates uh, but you can have clinical staff uh, under direct supervision from the provider uh, uh, do the interactive communication with the patient. So this could be the um, could be an LPN, it could be the medical assistant, et cetera, it would depend on your com uh, compliance practices, but those would be qualified individuals to um, have the patient communication under direct supervision. So um, 
So next question for Dr. Clemens is given the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and the decrease in general elective uh, procedures and budgets overall, um, how do we proceed with implementing a RPN program um, given lack of resources? Uh, yeah, so resources are a problem for uh, many, many clinics right now. I think that uh, this is the great thing about implementation science and uh, quality improvement as a field. So quality improvement does not suggest that one go out and make a 100% shift in your clinical practice approach all at once. Quality improvement methodology actually calls for small tests of change. So if you can simply reallocate or redirect 5% of your staff resources, uh, sometimes only 1% or 2%, um, you know, just try something new in one place in one week and then report back to your team on whether you had success. Uh, you can then take many small tests of change and start to build a program uh, that really has an impact on change. You know, usually the pathway for quality improvement work is that you try one cycle. The cycle can be one patient on one day. It can be one provider's clinic on one day. It can be all providers at a location uh, for one week. And, uh, and then you take that, you learn from it, and you decide whether to iterate, so to change the intervention in your clinic to make it better. So perhaps I'm trying to intervene, for instance, on um, just helping families navigate the technology for telehealth visits better. Well, I could iterate on the educational information that we share with families prior to that visit and how we distribute it. So maybe I was initially distributing it, you know, just via email. And maybe now uh, my team can not only distribute a pamphlet by email, but we can send it by the patient portal. We can send it a week earlier and we can accompany a small video link uh, that our team develops to help guide people through it visually. Uh, these are all small tests of change one can do to help virtual care, remote patient monitoring uh, become more successful. So. Uh, uh, small tests of change and iterate is the answer. Yeah. And this question is for Jeff from our product team. Um, the question is, how does the Gluco app uh, data come into the clinic side? Good question. So as a patient, you can share data via a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, you can choose to share a PDF with your clinician by emailing them a, a PDF directly from the Gluco app. There's also a feature we call ProConnect, which means you put in a unique code that the clinician gives to you, and that code connects your account to the clinician's account. Uh, and so going forward, as, as soon as you add data to the Gluco app at home, um, the clinician is able to see that data in real time. Okay, yeah. thanks. I think those are all the questions we have. Um, we wanna thank you all for joining our product session today. If you have any questions on this presentation, how to virtualize your practice or use any of our remote monitoring solutions, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters today with the email address uh, provided. We appreciate your time. Please stay safe, healthy, and have a great day. Thanks. Thanks everyone.